Hi, I'm Ben with Filthy Motorsports in Boulder, Colorado, and we specialize in high-end racing suspension systems. We currently work pretty much exclusively with King Off-Road Racing Shocks. We've had great luck working with them. We are one of their master distributors, currently doing about a million dollars per year in sales, growing at 20% per year. So we've uh, been very successful with them. And that comes from two things. One is we treat all orders as custom orders. So it's surprising to me at how many people still call me having spoken with other dealers, not just King, other manufacturers and brands as well, that treat shocks as an off the shelf product. Or maybe they'll just ask a few questions. Uh, what size shock do you need? How much travel? Do you want a reservoir? And then, okay, we'll get those shipped out. And it absolutely cannot be done that way. A small Toyota Truggy on 33 inch tires is totally different from a Chevy Duramax on Rockwells and AG tires, which is totally different from a street driven vehicle or a show rig or a trophy truck. Uh, add to that customer expectations, budgets, things that might change. You really have to focus on the entire build, the entire project uh, to do it correctly. So it can't be done as one size fits all. The other reason that we've become successful, and this is a total cliche, I know, but we've got the best customers. And whether that's because we market properly to them or reach out to them or whether they seek us out, we tend to get the men and, and the men and women that are do-it-yourselfers, the ones that come home from work to tinker for a few hours so they can go out wheeling on the weekend. And they don't just want to order something, get it and bolt it on and run it. They want to know why they're ordering it, why one is better than the other, or they want to learn about suspension theory and they soak it up and we love to teach it. Now, King does have a great line of OEM kits that are bolt-on. Uh, we've got a lot of customers like that, but even then, a bolt-on kit for a JK can be very different. Is it a two-door? Is it a four-door? Um, is it pretty much just a grocery getter? Is it used for desert racing? Is it used for camping, hunting, expedition use? Does it have heavy bumpers and armor on it or has it been gutted? We might need to tweak the spring rates and the valving a little bit. So even the stuff that you'd imagine would be bolt-on, we still treat it as a custom order. And what that means is whether you call us, email us, place an order online, you will get a follow-up from me personally. I personally follow up with all orders. If that's a phone call, I love talking to people on the phone, or it might be an email. I've got customers all over the world that we trade emails, they send me photos, ask for measurements. Uh, as long as you're able to get me what I need, we'll be able to build a set of shocks um, that'll suit your needs. Or might not even be a set of shocks. You might have to, or I might suggest looking into a set of ORIs, or I might tell you, you know, it's really best to save your money, run something generic for a while, and then uh, do it right down the road. We'll look at the entire vehicle, the entire application, the big picture, to make sure that you're getting what you need, because it's not buying a set of shocks. It's, you know, a shock is a shock. It's a cylinder, a piston, valving, shims, oil. It's, that's not what you're buying. What you're ultimately trying to get is performance, handling, control. What you're really trying to get is a vehicle that performs the way that you want it to. And so that's the focus that we have. And that means starting at the, at the very beginning. So in this video, I figured I would treat it like a typical sales phone call that I have. And they typically run 20 to 30 minutes. I'll try and condense it for the video, but it might be another long one. Uh, but we'll break it down into several sections. The first one being, why King? Why is it that we've chosen to work with King and why would you want a King Shock as opposed to some of the other brands? So we'll go over those details. Um, then we'll move on to the ordering process. Uh, what's the right shock for you? When's the right time to order? What information do we need? What information do we need to give you? What are your options? There are a ton of options from colors to adjusters to fittings uh, to different types of shocks. Um, we'll go over all of that, uh, including the, the ordering process. Uh, we'll go over timeframes, lead times, what to expect. Uh, and then we'll move on to what to do once you get the shocks, what to expect. Uh, we'll go over briefly the installation process and the setup process. I've got other videos that cover that. Um, so make sure to check out our full YouTube channel for some of those other videos, as well as a few um, that I'll be filming here shortly. So we'll cover that and then we'll move on to Preventative maintenance, how to maintain your shocks, how to service them. Um, they can be valved, uh, retuned, resealed. You can make adjustments. If you get a shock that's a little bit too short, you can swap things out. And that is one of the great things about Kings is if you get them and, they're, uh, and they get damaged, 
replacement parts are really easy to get and we can get those out to you. So we'll go over all of that. I'll cover as much as possible. You can probably already tell I could talk all day about this, but I'll try and condense it. And so with that, we will start with why would you go with the King Shock over other brands? When it comes to upgrading a suspension system or changing shocks, the end goal is always the same. It's to improve the performance and handling of the vehicle. That could be because the original shocks had worn out and just need to be replaced, or you've changed the entire purpose, use, or dynamics of a vehicle and need an entirely new set of shocks. In either case, it all comes down to the shock valving and the ability for that shock to do that work. All shocks work the exact same way. You have a piston that's drilled to allow oil to move through it. So that piston moves up and down through the shock body, oil moves through those ports. On either end, you'll have some shims. It might be a single shim, might be a full shim stack like these, but this plugs the holes. It's kind of like putting your thumb on the end of a garden hose. It makes that oil flow uh, a bit tougher. And so having those shims there slow down the piston and that's where the damping comes from. Lower quality shocks use a very small piston and very simple shims. More expensive shocks uh, like these Kings have a CNC machined piston uh, and a full stack with, you know, we, we choose the specific shim thicknesses, the layout, the count, configuration to get that um, tuning dialed in. So all shocks work this way. So on the basic end of things, I've got a Crown Victoria grocery getter kind of secondary car. Shocks wore out on that. I was getting the bouncy ride. I did not want to spend a lot of money on it. So you do what most people do, just get a generic set of shocks. And these are all imported. They come from China. It's pretty much one size fits all, I would say. You'll find these in the white cylinders or the black cylinders with any number of logos on them. They're pretty much all the same. You get a tiny little piston, and on the inside you'll have something that resembles a shim stack, I guess. Uh, and these will be inside of a cylinder where the oil and the nitrogen is mixed together called an emulsion shock. So not very precise, um, not very controlled, definitely not tailored or customized. But you know what? It dampens the movement in both directions. It'll help get rid of that bouncy ride. And for, uh, for what, 120 bucks, 150 bucks installed all the way around, kind of hard to beat for, you know, for a ride if you don't really care too much about it. It was great for me and my Crown Vic. Moving up from there, if you're trying to improve the handling of a vehicle, uh, don't want to spend the amount, or if you're not ready for a full set of Kings, but you just want that uh, slight improvement, that's where the $70 to $100 Bilsteins and uh, Old Man Emu shocks kind of come into play. I've run Bilsteins on both of my Super Duties. I run Old Man Emus on my uh, Land Cruiser. And for the money, they do a great job. You get a... It's a slightly bigger piston, but it's significantly more surface area, so it can do quite a bit more work, almost double. You'll see that it's closer to a traditional piston design now. You have shim stacks, um, you know, much nicer, uh, higher quality components. These are generally in a cylinder where there's an internal floating piston separating the nitrogen from the oil, so it's more precise. And these will usually be um, tailored to more tailored to the vehicle. So they're different whether it's a leaf spring or a coil spring or an A-arm. I know that on my old man emus I had a choice whether it was stock weight or to offset for my ARB bumper that I have on it and they do a great job. Uh, what you'll find though is they still have their limitations. Uh, on both my Super Duties and my Land Cruiser, 20 to 30 minutes running down a dirt road or um, a gravel road or something will get them up to that 250, 280, 300 uh, degrees Fahrenheit temperature, at which point they start to fade. Uh, I also normally get about two, maybe three years out of them before they have to be replaced. So when you're looking at 240, 300 bucks all the way around, you do that a couple of times and you're in the price range of a set of King Shocks uh, that should last the life of the vehicle. So that's kind of that trade-off you have to make is, do you just want something to hold you over before you get Kings or are you okay with replacing them every two or three years? Um, on these, find a part number, jump on Amazon, jump on eBay. It's pretty much one size fits all. Uh, any, any place you can find them for the cheapest, that's where you get them. Now from these, there's quite, I'd call it an empty gap before you get to a set of Kings or a high-end shocks. Uh, at, which point, at which point you get a full CNC machine piston, full shims, larger shaft, 
billet aluminum components, uh, just you know, basically top of the line stuff. With Kings, you're going to be looking at high 200s, 300s, maybe into the $400 price range per shock, depending on the features that you need. Uh, again, totally customized for the uh, for the vehicle. The reason I say that there's an empty gap between them is in that price range between the two, you'll find what I call the gimmicky shocks. You'll have the budget high performance shocks, the ones that claim to be as good as the high end shocks, but at half the price. And on those, do some uh, Google searches for some reviews first. Take a look at our crawlpedia.com shock shoot at. We post the insides of a lot of those shocks. To make a high end shock, it requires expensive machinery, expensive components, labor, it's expensive to build a really good set of shocks and you get what you pay for. A lot of the budget high-end shocks, they cut a lot of corners and we expose that on crawlpedia.com, so watch out for those. The next issue that you'll find within that gap is the lift kit company shocks. And I'm going to expose an industry secret here, uh, so <laughs> don't hate me, uh, you guys out there, but uh, Lift kit companies do not make any money on lift kits, or they make very little money on lift kits. Steel is expensive, manufacturing is expensive, transportation, labor, liability, all of that stuff adds up, so they don't make a lot of money on lift kits. To make up for that, they come out with their own line of high-end, high-performance shocks, but those are strictly designed to be built as cheap as possible and to be sold for as expensive as possible. Now, there's a few brands out there that I wish I could be a high, you know, top dealer for. Um, it would make so much more money, but at that price point, you're not getting anywhere close to the performance that you could be. So you've got to watch out for those as well. We build a lot of King Shocks for customers that have bought lift kits, had them installed, passed on the shocks so that we can build a proper set. And that's where you get kind of the best of both worlds. You get a nice lift kit and then a true high-end set of shocks. The third gap filler, as far as shocks goes, is more of the gimmicky stuff. And I don't mean to throw this company under the bus. I think they do great stuff. Um, run the old man emus on my Land Cruiser with great results within the price range. But they've recently come out with this uh, internal bypass shock. This is loosely, well, almost identically the same as what uh, the Ford Raptor rear shocks are. It claims to be a 2.5 shock. But the piston on the inside is actually the same size as the Bilstein or the smaller Old Man Emu. It does separate the shock into separate zones, so you can have a, a heavy bottom out, a heavy top out, a, a softer central uh, zone. It's adjustable, so you can kind of fine tune that, and it definitely works. The issue is, normally when you're spending a lot of money on shocks or trying to um, buy shocks to make the vehicle perform better. You're also taking into account endurance, be, being able to run a hard for an hour or two. And these have the same issue as my regular Old Man Emu or Bilsteins. You get 20 to 30 minutes in and you're already starting to have the shock fade on you. These would work great for basically a mild trail runner, mild rock crawler, spends most of the time on the street. For that, they get the job done. But at that price point, I'd have a really hard time recommending it. Uh, along that line, I mentioned, and this drives me nuts. This is the uh, this is the back of a the rear shocks on a Ford Raptor. Same basic concept. They claim it to be a 2.5 bypass shock. It does have that bypass feature with the shims on the inside. Totally not tunable or adjustable. It basically works the way that uh, you buy it. And the piston is that same size. Now these go under a full size truck that's supposed to go 70, 80, 90 miles an hour through the desert. And that is not nearly enough piston to be able to do that job. I think they're banking off of the idea that most Raptor owners spend 99% of the time on the street. And if they do go off road, it's 10 to 20 minutes at a time, at which point, you know, they'll work good enough. The problem is the replacement cost on these is the same as a set of King full on bypass shocks where they use a three inch piston. You'll notice it's bigger than the outside diameter of the shock that can finally do the amount of work that it needs to. Plus it's externally adjustable. Uh, for most F-150 owners though, I just say go with the uh, OEM kit that gives you a 2.5 King shock and that is plenty of shock for just about anything you do with that truck, especially if it's custom tuned uh, for those leaf springs. So you got to watch out for some of those uh, gimmicks that are out there. Um, most of them do certainly work, but um, 
you know, I think they've got a lot of flaws. Um, and we kind of do that research for you. As to, if you've probably seen some of my other videos, I'm a sucker for cutaways. Anything new that comes out, I want to see how it works. I want to see why, you know, if the claims are true. But uh, it goes along with my philosophy. I will never sell something to a customer unless I've tried it myself, have had good feedback. Um, I, I believe in it, and I know that the manufacturer is going to stand behind it. Those are kind of my criteria for anything that I recommend. And you know, if something new comes out that uh, is better, I will be the first on uh, on board with it. But um, those are the things that you kind of have to watch out for and uh, give you a sense of uh, what's available. With that covered, let's move on to the King Shocks themselves so I can show you why they are my top recommendation and why we pretty much use them exclusively for uh, suspension upgrades. So one question that I get asked multiple times a day is, why King? Why is it that we work with King Shocks as opposed to the other manufacturers? And the truth is, we chose to work with them because they do pretty much everything right. Um, yeah, they've got their flaws and we've learned to work around some of their quirks and stuff, but pretty much everything that a shock manufacturer needs to do, they do correctly. And we are dealers for all of the major shock manufacturers, it's just they all come up short in one way or the other. With King, there's four reasons that I find that uh, they produce the best shocks. And the first off, most obvious being, I think it's the fit and the finish, including the quality of the materials, the tolerances to which they're machined, the, the finishes, the colors, the components, uh, even the reservoir fittings. Uh, I recently noticed... Um, they're rounded on the inside so that the oil flows smoother, whereas some hydraulic fittings have a, a sharp edge on the inside. Little details like that, they pretty much get everything right. Um, in our Crawlpedia Shock Shootout, uh, a lot of the major manufacturers get really, really close, and then we find a fatal flaw, an issue that's just so close, but then not proper. And King has been around long enough and they've built enough shocks for enough race teams that they've kind of perfected all of those little things. So the fit and the finish and overall quality, in my opinion, is top notch. But that's not enough. Um, a lot of, you know, a handful of companies out there still build very, very high quality shocks, but they have to be valved properly. And King is one of the few that allows us to send them a build sheet so that they can build a shock with the proper valving already built into them. Not like some shocks that maybe you can get them quicker, but once you get them, they've got generic valving, so you've got to go in and revalve them. And what you don't realize is getting the shims and getting the parts for some of those companies is much harder than getting the shock itself. So with King, after working with the customer, we put together a build sheet, we'd submit it to King, we get their race team or their guys that work with their racers to review them. So you get a second set of eyes looking over all build sheets and that goes into production so that once they're done, built and shipped, you simply take them out of the box, bolt them on the vehicle and uh, you should be good to go. Uh, I always say that I would way rather drive in a vehicle that has crappy shocks that are valved properly than the drive in one with a high end set of shocks that aren't tuned properly. The valving is way more important. And so if you can get the quality of the shock and have it valve properly, um, you know, that's a majority of the way there. The next important thing is I need a company that will stand behind their product, meaning that if there's a problem, if there's an issue, um, if a customer damages their shock and they need a replacement part, I need to be able to get replacement parts, get them shipped relatively quickly. Yeah, King usually takes two or three days to get stuff shipped, but they will get it shipped. They've got replacement parts in stock. I keep a lot of shims and seal kits and everything here. Um, I can service a customer's shocks when they need to be serviced without a long lead time. And to me, that's really important. So they stand behind the product as well. And then finally, and we'll kind of go over this uh, a little bit more in a bit, they offer a ton of options. And not just shock sizes and travel, but a bunch of different options ranging from finishes that, you know, we've got a chrome shock. This is a piggyback bypass. You've got foam bump stops, different bearings and rod ends. Uh, they recently released clicker adjusters. So you can quickly adjust the bypasses. You know, we've got custom anodized um, components there, different decals. Uh, you know, on this one, We've got a 90 degree fitting. You've got an internal bypass, which is a really cool feature that puts a hydraulic bump stop inside. Uh, they, rec they recently came back with a black Cerakote finish. This is one of the older black uh, zinc finishes, but they finally came back with that. 
billet sliders, I mean, uh, extended rod ends to make the shock a little bit longer. Um, uh, I've got a new display shock here that's got their new finned reservoirs, the protected uh, Schrader valve, uh, custom powder coated cylinder over the top cap, over the cylinder top cap to reduce the, the height of the shock. Tons and tons and tons of different options so that we can build the shock exactly to what the customer needs. And that's critical. So now not only can we do the exact shock to fit the exact space and do the proper colors and reservoir uh, layouts that's needed, we've got a company that stands behind it, we've got the proper valving that goes into it, and we've got the highest quality components. So they're the only company that hits all of those marks, and that's the reason that we work with King. When it comes to ordering King shocks, it is my job to make that process as easy and accurate and pleasant as possible. So whether you are pretty sure you know what you need and you've placed the order online, I'm still going to follow up with you, ask the questions I needed to ask, and it might be a short conversation. We'll check off all the boxes and we'll get that bill sheet in. Or you might have no clue what you need. You might have just started a brand new build and you're not sure whether you're going to go full four link and, and coilovers all the way around. or just throw on some aftermarket coils and some shocks. In any case, you will be talking with me. Uh, I do all of the sales calls over here. I do all of the King uh, shock phone calls. I respond to all of the emails. I do have people behind the scenes that send tracking numbers and order status updates. And I've got a team of people that help me out, but I like having these conversations. I love teaching, uh, suspension theory and, and going over suspension to customers. So I'm the one that you're going to reach on the phone. Now, uh, I know I'm not the easiest person to reach. I know that especially during the busy season, uh, when you call Filthy Motorsports, you'll get a message that says we're a day or two behind. But please, leave a message. I promise I will get back to you. My philosophy and one thing I've learned that customers appreciate more than anything is I do not rush. So it, I'm not going to rush to get that order in. I'm not going to put an order in before I have all the information that I need. I'm not going to try to rush you off of the phone to get to the next customer. Once you've got me, you've got my undivided attention. Once an order has been placed, it takes priority and I will do whatever it takes to make it right. And King does the exact same thing. You can't rush an order through King. It's They will take the time that it takes to build a shock and that's all about getting it right. So if you're in a rush, you need something really quickly, let me know. There are a few other manufacturers I work with. Um, you've used them for Hollywood movies and other things where you just need to get stuff really, really quickly and can sacrifice a few things. Um, so there are a few other options, but if you can just count on it, expect the shocks to take anywhere from two to three or four weeks during the slow season to six to eight weeks for some highly customized shocks um, during the busy season. Plan on it. I will always give you an honest estimate of what I think the shocks are going to take, but they're handmade. They take their time. Coatings um, have to get sent out. Um, shipping, bad weather can delay things. So the best thing to do is expect them to take some time. And then once you've ordered them, forget about them. I promise you I'll send you a tracking number once I get it. But uh, also never feel um, bad to send me an email and ask for an update. I've got people that kind of follow up with King and send responses to customers. So that's pretty much the way that I work. And I will follow up with you no matter what stage you're in. The other piece of advice uh, is call me as soon as possible. Reach out to me. Send me an email. Uh, as soon as you think you're going to be looking into a high-end suspension system. Because uh, the sooner you reach out to me, the more valuable my advice is going to be. I get a lot of customers that call me ready to order shocks only to have me tell them, gosh, if you only would have raised the front shock mounts up a couple of inches and lean them closer to vertical or because of your swing out tire carrier, it'd be nicer to have the rear coilovers move backwards. There's a lot of things like that that would be good to know before you burn in all your mounts and have to go back and change it or live with a less than ideal setup. So during those conversations, we normally start with shooting for the theoretical ideal. Shooting for, you know, what's the proper geometry in the setup going to be in the ideal world? Granted, we've got oil pans and drive shafts and fenders and uh, all sorts of clearance issues and things that we've got to work with, but we shoot for the ideal and then we dial things back as needed. So, um, and then we'll also go over the budget. You know, there's a big difference between being on an absolute budget and maybe 
uh, just throwing on a set of shocks versus doing a full-on race suspension system. Uh, one thing that I laugh about or have my customers laugh at me about, and I have them tell me all the time, I get called the worst salesman in the entire world because a lot of times a customer will have ordered a set of 3.0 coilovers and bypasses only to have me talk them out of an $8,000 order into a $2,000 order because a smaller coilover in hydraulic bump stop setup will give them way more performance. With suspension, more isn't always better. Spending a ton more money doesn't always give you a better performance. In fact, a lot of times spending too much gives you lesser performance. So those are all things we're gonna go over and I am a straight shooter. I will tell you as it is, um, whether it's good news or bad news, um, at least you'll have an honest answer. So call me as soon as possible, even if it's a year in advance, it gives you some time to plan. When you are ready, you'll call me or you place the order online if you're comfortable. Orders placed online do get priority treatment, so at least it'll give you a quicker phone call that way. But we'll review it, and the questions that I'm going to ask you are stuff that you're going to know, so you don't have to worry about having the vehicle scaled or weighed or, or measured. I'm gonna ask you things like, where are your upper coilover mounts in relation to the engine? What, how much up travel did you wanna have? Um, what's your ride height going to be? Are you running or planning to run hydraulic bump stops or not? Are you running an Atlas transfer case or a doubler kit, swing out tire carrier? Uh, what are you running for axles and tires? Really basic things that you're going to know. And as far as the weight of the vehicle goes, if we're doing coilovers, I've done this enough times that basically a brief description of the vehicle, a couple of photos, and I can estimate it very, very closely. If you've had it scaled, absolutely, give me those numbers, I'll use them as a double check. But all I'm trying to get across is don't stress over it. I know it's a lot of money and I know that shocks can seem really complicated, but it's my job to make that process easy for you and I find it my responsibility to make sure that the order matches what your expectations are. And that's of course another big part of that conversation that we'll have is what are your expectations? I mean, are you expecting a soft and comfortable ride or are you expecting it to run you know, fast through the desert? There's a lot of stuff that's contradictory. Uh, there's a lot of valving that you can't do the best of both worlds. So we decide, do we tailor it more for one than the other? Do we shoot for the middle? Um, do we upgrade to a set of bypasses to kind of give more tuning? We'll have that conversation so that you kind of get the results that you need and have a realistic expectation. I'll be filming another video here shortly as well, which is having realistic expectations on valving. Um, there's some cases where you just can't get it if you don't have enough suspension travel or if the suspension is highly um, leveraged. Not everything is possible or you're going to have to live with a harsher ride or a firmer ride to compensate from bottoming out too often. We'll go over all of that. So that's what our conversations kind of go over. Um, that will kind of come up with what we're looking at suspension wise. And from there, we'll go over some of the available options that you have, um, being compression adjusters and finishes and colors and fittings. Uh, so we'll go over that in detail uh, in the next segment. As I've mentioned a couple of times already, there are a lot of options when it comes to King Shocks. So the first decision that needs to be made is what type of shock is right for you? Uh, and then we'll go into what combination is right for your application. So a rock crawler is very different than a, a desert racer and we'll go over which combinations are right for, um, for those types of applications. So the first style of shock is the most common. It's what you think of when someone says the word shock and I call it a smoothie. It's got a smooth cylinder and it's you know, it's, it's exactly what you think of when you see a shock. These require some form of external spring, so they do not support the weight of the vehicle. You'll need to have either coil springs or airbags or leaf springs. Uh, the shock is tuned very differently depending on the type of spring you've got them in, but we take care of that during the ordering process. This one has a remote reservoir on it, and I've dedicated another video to the reservoir because there's a lot of misconceptions out there. A lot of people ask, do I need a reservoir? And the answer is always yes. People tend to think, and it's a real common sense thing to kind of to think that these are for cooling, but while they do a little bit of that, that's not at all what they're there for. The reservoir separates the nitrogen pressure from the oil so that the shock cylinder is 100% filled with oil as it cycles. Without a reservoir, 
the nitrogen is mixed in with the oil, so the piston's moving through this bubbly mixture. It's like having air bubbles in your power steering system. You'll still be able to steer, but it's not nearly as controlled. So anytime you're building a performance system or performance shock setup, you absolutely need to have reservoirs. So this is the most simple type. It's just uh, your, stra your uh, straightforward shock. A bit more advanced from there would be the bypass shock, and it's kind of the same concept. However, it has these bypass tubes, these external tubes with adjustments on them. What these tubes do is they allow the oil to bypass the valving on the piston, thus the name. They break the shock into separate zones so you can control the damping in different ranges. You can have a heavy bottom out zone, a heavier top out zone, a softer central range, and then you can kind of uh, transition the, the the valving from the central range into the bump stop so you don't have a hard hit, uh, but rather kind of feather it in. Uh, these we typically call trim tubes. So a bypass shock also requires some form of external spring. Generally, if you're going to bypass shocks, you're going to already have coilovers and hydraulic bump stops that we'll uh, touch on in a second. Um, but these are pretty much a race-only application. It's, it's rare to see these on a daily driven vehicle. In fact, I'd never recommend them for that. Although some people buy them because they look really cool and I guess there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but they are pretty much race-only because you really need that uh, dialing in. Uh, and when you are running bypass shocks, everything else needs to be tuned a little bit differently because you want as much of the vehicle valving happening in the bypass shock. So those are the two types of shocks that do not support the weight of the vehicle. Moving from there, if you've got a four-link setup or a three-link or a long-travel A-arm setup or I-beams, you'll likely be looking at what's called a coilover. And again, it's based off of the concept of a smoothie shock. That's what you have down the middle, except it's got a threaded cylinder on which the coilover hardware mounts and it supports these springs. I've got a couple other videos that I go over spring rates and coilover setup in. Uh, however, all you need to know here is uh, you do not have to worry about spring rates or setup or ride height. That's something that uh, I will take care of for you during the ordering process. And Filthy Motorsports offers us free spring exchange when we calculate them for you, so we'll stand behind it. But ultimately, the coilover supports the weight of the vehicle with these springs. And it could be a single spring, it could be two springs, it might be a tender spring on top of that. Um, we go over that in our other coilover videos. The coilover, in my opinion, is always the end game. If you're trying to get the best performance out of a vehicle, it's going to be a coilover. I mean, look at Formula One racing even uses them, stock car racing. Any major form of racing, you'll find coilovers. And the reason for it is it's the amount of adjustability you get out of them. You can choose your ride height, you can choose your spring rates. In a dual rate setup, you can choose where the spring rates transition from a lighter rate to a heavier rate. And that's still, that's in addition to the shock valving and everything else. So adjustability and tunability is what gets you that good performance. With a standalone shock setup, you're dependent on that other spring working. And a lot of times you can't adjust an external leaf spring or a coil spring unless you totally swap it out. So this makes adjustability a lot easier and gives you a lot more control. So again, coilovers, in my opinion, are always the end game. So other than a coilover, another popular choice out there, although one I don't really recommend too often, is the air shock or the nitrogen shock. And it's very similar to that smoothie that I showed you first. However, it's got a much larger shaft because now this shaft is supporting the weight of the vehicle uh, due to the nitrogen pressure inside of that cylinder. So the nitrogen pressure in here that you charge through a Schrader valve lifts the vehicle and supports it. So the issue with these, and we can play with oil levels and things, but the problem with an air shock is you can choose your spring rate or you can choose your ride height, but you can't easily choose both. And wherever it settles the vehicle, I can valve it for any spot within the shock, but as soon as it moves up a couple of inches or down a couple of inches, that spring rate is exponentially different, so the valving is no longer as good in those ranges. Plus, since nitrogen is an exponential spring, as soon as it fully compresses, it wants to unload really hard. So we put heavier rebound valving into it, similar to what we would do with a leaf spring, to help keep it from unloading. 
Uh, so tuning, you, you don't get nearly as much performance out of an AirShock, although it's simple, it's small, it's more affordable. So if you're in a pinch, if you just need something to hold you over, if you're on a budget, uh, AirShocks could be the right choice. Although for about an extra 100 bucks or so more, you can have a 2.0 body coilover that gives you a lot more performance. So um, we do still sell quite a few of them, uh, but I always try to talk people into coilovers for the additional performance. Uh, another option along those lines, and I mentioned this company at the very beginning of this video, and it's not within the King lineup, but it's one that we uh, we sell a ton of. In fact, we're uh, their largest dealer. It's the ORI strut. So they're becoming more and more popular. Um, some people still haven't heard of them, but uh, they've exploded recently, and um, chances are you've seen them if you've been out on the trails. It's basically a highly advanced air shock, and I, I hate to call it an air shock because it's I think it's in a whole different category, but it uses two opposing nitrogen pressure forces to help kind of stabilize the shock. Um, it's got an anti-push-off feature, so if you're crawling a ledge and the suspension compresses in, it stays compressed so it doesn't bounce you off like an air shock does or to a lesser degree a coilover. It's got a built-in hydraulic bump stop, it's got adjustable rebound control on the bottom, and uh, they are a great choice for lighter weight vehicles that are used for rock crawling and trail running. Not something that you, you you'd use on a endurance vehicle or on a desert racer, but for trail running and rock crawling, if the vehicle's around 5,000 pounds overall weight or under, I normally start with these as a top recommendation. And if uh, it ends up not working out, we'll move into a set of coilovers. But ORI struts are another uh, option to look into. And we'll have another video on these soon. So now that we've got the vehicle supported and we've got some dampening happening uh, throughout the range, the last item or style of shock we want to look at is what's called a hydraulic bump stop. And it's basically a small air shock. It's got nitrogen pressure in there that pushes out on the bump. You've got oil, you've got a full piston, so it's built just like a shock absorber. There are other brands of hydraulic bump stops that are significantly cheaper than King's, but they've got much smaller internal components. Uh, we show the different brands on crawlpedia.com, so you can kind of take a look at the insides there. But King's are really well worth it because it's built like a full-on shock. So they might seem expensive, but you realize you're buying a, a full shock with them. What these do is they kick in during the last couple inches of your suspension travel. Um, without hydraulic bump stops, you might have a rubber block or a polyurethane bump stop or a timbrin. And you'll notice that whenever you bottom out, it tends to be a hard hit. It's, it's a sudden stop near the end, which might be okay if it's a rock crawler, but if it's a desert racer or something that's driving faster, those hard hits transfer a lot of energy. Or for a mud truck that's jumping sky high and it lands, you don't want that hard hit near the end. So a hydraulic bump stop kicks in at the very end of that stroke to kind of dampen it in a highly exponential rate. Um, if you've called us or if you place an order, you'll hear us mention a hydraulic bump stop. I consider them mandatory for any high performance suspension system because not only do they do what I just said, but they allow us to tune the shock for the entire stroke of the suspension. Without a hydraulic bump stop, now we need to tune the coilover or the shock to prevent the vehicle from bottoming out. So we've got to go firmer on the valving. Um, there's a lot more that goes into it, but a Hydraulic bump stop allows the shock to do its job. It kicks in during the end stroke uh, to make the bottom out a lot more present, uh, pleasant and you end up using more of your suspension travel. So hydraulic bump stops, uh, again, I consider them uh, pretty much mandatory. So those are the different styles of shocks. Now let's go over different applications and in which combinations you'd use these um, for your vehicle. When it comes to choosing a shock combination for a vehicle, we start with the basics. What kind of vehicle is it and how is it used? If it's a mostly stock vehicle, your Broncos, K5 Blazers, F250s, they've already got springs on them, whether they're leaf springs or coil springs, so generally we'll just do a smoothie shock. Uh, maybe if it's used a bit more aggressively, we'll add some hydraulic bump stops, but that's pretty much all that it takes and it's fairly simple. Uh, some customers might want to take a step further and add bypass shocks to it, but I find that you have to draw a line somewhere. Uh, if you're going to work with the stock suspension geometry, going all out with coilovers, bypasses, bump stops, uh, is spending a lot of money and effort to make them work when it just takes a bit more to gut the suspension you have in there, move on to a four link or a trailing arm setup, and you'll have more travel and better performance. But it's about finding that balance. Um, generally, when you're reusing the stock springs or if you've got aftermarket uh, springs bolted onto it, uh, 
you're looking for a bulletproof, reliable style of setup. And so a good set of 2.0 or 2.5 smoothie shocks really gets the job done. Moving on from there, you've got your modern vehicles, your SUVs, your trucks, your Jeeps, and King has you covered with their line of OEM kits. And there's more and more of these coming out all the time. They've got coilovers for A-arm suspension systems and shocks for leaf springs and coil springs. And these are specced out and built and valved to just bolt on to that vehicle. We do account for additional weight and if the vehicle is used for racing or if it spends only, uh, if it spends all this time on the street, we can tweak the valving, we can tweak the springs. And then you have your choice of colors and compression adjusters and other options, just like all of the other shocks because they're built exactly the same and using the same components as all of the other King shocks. So this isn't some sort of knockoff budget thing that King has released. These are identical to the coilovers and bypass and uh, smoothie shocks uh, that we're going over here now. So those are a great choice. Uh, I've got a set on my 08 Super Duty with the coilover conversion and it was a day and night difference in performance. Uh, from there, you've got the different styles of vehicles, your custom vehicles, uh, your rock crawlers, your mud trucks, your desert racers, Dakar, uh, full race uh, trophy trucks. And we look at those based off of their suspension system uh, before we go on to how they're used. So the most common form of suspension system for most rock crawlers and mud trucks and hill and hole racers is a four link system. And I'm not going to go into the different styles too much. We've got other videos for that, but a four link system basically positions a solid axle and allows it to articulate and move. In a setup like this, you need the shocks to support the weight of the vehicle. So that's where you're looking at your coilovers, your air shocks, your ORIs. And the choice there is, is pretty simple. If, if the vehicle is really light and it's used mainly for low speed technical rock crawling, I'd recommend the ORIs. And if you're on an absolute budget, throw some air shocks in there. For more aggressive use, or if you don't want to go the ORIs, the most common and most popular setup that we do is a set of 2.0 coilovers paired with 2.0 hydraulic bump stops uh, limited to three inches of travel. That combination just works very, very well for tube chassis vehicles, CJ's 5, CJ's 7s, Jeeps in general, um, Samurais, uh, you know, generally you start off with a base vehicle and then gut it uh, until it's unrecognizable. But a 2.0 coilover with a hydraulic bump stop is, it gets you 90% of the way there. If you start to be more aggressive with it, if you do more high speed desert runs, if it's uh, endurance runs, six to eight hours straight without stopping with fully loaded, if you're going out hunting or camping with it, that might justify a 2.5 coilover. Uh, if you're fully racing it, uh, like Ultra 4 cars are nowadays, they've got that set up and they add bypass shocks. So again, bypass shocks are really used for the race side of things. As soon as you're going really fast, you need the additional heat dissipation. You need to really fine tune uh, the zones within that shock. You can always add a bypass shock uh, to a coilover to get that additional performance. But usually for trail rigs, rigs and rock crawlers, coilovers and hydraulic bump stops or ORIs uh, are kind of your two best choices. Moving up in size from there, you've got your mud trucks, hill and hole racers, and generally on those we'll do a 2.5 coilover. Uh, that'll get you up to 18 inches of travel, and that's good enough for most people. I do have a group of mud truck uh, guys up in New York that have done the coilover and bypass setup, and uh, I use them as my success story because they are smoking guys in their class, and they're under un underpowered by about 200 horsepower. If you can keep the tires on the ground with a well-tuned suspension system, I would take that over more power any day. So we can go real crazy with it, but generally for big mud trucks, a 2.5 coilover with a 2.5 hydraulic bump stop does very, very well. Moving up to the, uh, from there to your monster trucks, we'll do a 3.0 coilover and again hydraulic bump stops. So for a four-link setup, it can be built for slow speed rock crawling, it can be built for uh, high speed desert racing or mud trucks, uh, a very, very common suspension system. From there, uh, moving on to more of the desert side of things, including your sand rails, dune buggies, UTVs, you'll see A-arms. Um, and A-arms, are they're named after the capital letter A because that's what the arms look like. In a setup like this, the coilover that's supporting the weight of the vehicle again is mounted inside or along that leverage point. So it's, it's seeing a two to one ratio or somewhere around that usually. That means that that coilover is working twice as hard. And that's something we absolutely have to consider during the spring uh, calculation process and the valving because it's, it thinks the vehicle weighs twice as much or more in some cases. So 
for vehicles like this, and this could include your Toyota Tacomas uh, with long travel kits on them, we'll generally do a 2.5 coilover and then a hydraulic bump stop, and that works very well. The bypasses, again, would be used for the more aggressive side of things, the higher higher speeds, the longer distance running, because uh, you look at them more for the additional tuning as well as the additional oil capacity for that heat dissipation um, to prevent the shocks from fading. So with A-arms, um, we'll do a coilover for something like a UTV or some sand rails. It might be a 2.0 because it's ultra light. Uh, anything bigger, we do a 2.5 coilover. I generally wouldn't do a 3.0 coilover in here because again, all you're gonna be using that coilover for is supporting the weight of the vehicle. We'd go with a bigger bypass shock for the additional cooling and tuning. So coilovers work very well in A-arms and then you'd add a bypass shock. The last type of suspension system we'll go over is the trailing arm. Uh, these you'll see on your trophy trucks, your desert racers, a lot of Ultra 4 cars are seeing them now, uh, and even some UTVs are coming out with them, and it's a lot like the A-arm. Uh, it has a chassis mount on one end, and then it mounts to the axle on the other end, and then the coilover mount somewhere in the middle. Because of how advanced this suspension system is and how much work it takes to build it, generally this is used for race vehicles, and so we'll see a 2.5 coilover paired with a 2.5 or 3.0 bypass shock, and then you'd have a hydraulic bump stop directly on the axle. Um, you try not to leverage the bump stop. I know that it tends to happen on A-arms, uh, so you've got to go with a much bigger bump stop if it's leveraged up front. Uh, in the rear, you can generally get away with a smaller bump stop if it's mounted directly on the axle, which is where it should be. Uh, for some trophy trucks, they'll go up to a 3.0 where now they've got 3.5 coilovers and 4.0, 4.5 and bigger bypasses. Uh, that's outside of the scope of this video, but there are a ton of other options for the full-on race vehicles that we do. Outside of that, uh, those tend to be the most common, but it's not limited to that. Uh, we've done shocks for industrial applications, uh, military applications, uh, mining applications. We've done them for uh, aircrafts and a bunch of stuff that I can't uh, say because we do a lot of, um, we sign non-disclosure agreements for companies and, and do all sorts of different things. If there's something that needs to be slowed down, moved, dampened, or controlled, uh, we can give it a shot. So well, we're not limited to that, and we actually like uh, you know, thinking outside of the box. Those are some of the best projects that we've done. So that kind of covers the, uh, the, the range of combinations that you might be using. So now let's move on to the individual shocks themselves and the options you can have on those. In addition to the various shock styles that King offers, there's a lot of functional as well as cosmetic options that are available. So we always start with the size of the shock whenever we're building up an order. And you've probably heard me in the previous section mention 2.0, 2.5 shocks. That refers to the shock cylinder, the diameter of the shock cylinder. The larger the shock, the larger the piston surface area, the more the oil, the more work the shock can do. So whereas a slow speed rock crawler doesn't generate nearly as much heat as a desert racing uh, trophy truck. You, the rock crawler can get away with a 2.0 coilover, whereas the desert uh, racer might need a 2.5 coilover with a 3.0 bypass next to it. So not just the size of the shock, but the combination in which they're, they're, um, they're placed determines the amount of work that they can do. So a 2.0 shock has a two inch outside diameter, a 2.5 is a two and a half inch outside diameter, and then 3.0, 3.5 moves up from there. The next piece to the equation is the shaft travel. So this is a 2.5 by 12 inch shock. That means it's got a two and a half inch outside diameter and the shaft moves 12 inches. So if you take the compressed length of the shock measured from eye to eye, shocks are always measured from center of bolt to center of bolt. If you take the compressed length and then you have the extended length, it's going to be 12 inches different. Keep in mind that rubber bump stops, coilover hardware, other things that go in there will eat that up or eat up or eat into that space. Also, generally you shouldn't be fully extending the shock. You should be running limiting straps and then you should have some form of external bump stop so you're not really bottoming out on it. As soon as that external bump stop bottoms out, you should be just about kissing the rubber bump stop on the shock. So realistically on a 12 inch coilover or a 12 inch shock, you're likely going to be cycling about 11 inches on that. So keep that in mind. The Compressed and extended lengths are also different between some sizes of shocks. Um, they're also different between brands. They're also different with air shocks or ORIs. So double check, always make sure to double check. The components on a King shock are much larger than you'll find on a generic shock or a Bilstein or a Rancho. 
so they will rarely fit into the same space. So we always start by asking for the compressed measurement because that's our limiting factor. You always take the compressed measurement of the vehicle, we try and fit the largest shock we can within that space and see if you get enough shaft to travel out of it. Um, if you want to check for yourself, on our website, on all of our shocks, we list the compressed and extended lengths. Again, all measured from eye to eye. So match that to your application and see if we can make a shock fit. There are things we can do to make the shocks taller or smaller. These are your standard rod ends, a regular build aluminum bottom end, um, regular top cap. We can shorten the shock by using what we call a welded lower rod end. So instead of being uh, an aluminum piece, the housing for the bearing is actually welded to the shaft. That eats up one inch. And then on the top, King has released this over the cylinder top cap. So instead of threading inside of the cylinder where it takes up space, it threads from the outside and that saves you about three quarters of an inch. Then we can remove the shock shaft spacer and do things like that to maximize the shaft travel out of the cylinder size. But again, you're talking about two inches shorter if we're really um, pushing it, which is still gonna be a lot bigger than your Bilstein or your Rancho, but that might be the difference of being able to fit it in that tight Tacoma rear end or um, into an A-arm setup that's uh, you know, that, that you're limited. So those are things we can do to make the shock smaller. On the lower rod end, on the bottom of that shaft, we can do extended lower rod ends. So these not only make the shock larger, which we might do for some uh, big mud trucks to get the upper shock mount as high as possible, but if you've got A-arms or trailing arms where the bolt is inside, the, this is a three inch extended rod end, we'll get deep down into it so you can put that cross bolt through. So those are things we can do to make the shock shorter or larger um, you know, within a decent amount of distance. The next thing that we look at are the misalignment spacers, the, the bolt that actually holds the top and bottom of the shock. They go through a spherical bearing on the 2.5 and the 3.0 shocks. That, those bearings have a 5 8 inch inter, inner diameter. And on a 2.0 shock, those have a 1 half inch inner diameter. So on the 2.0s, we can bump those up to a 5 8 inch bearing. And I'll tell you in a second why that's important. A, any mounting application, whether it's a small rock crawler or a big diesel mud truck, you're always going to be running a half inch bolt. I know that King offers a 5 8 inch bolt that is listed on our website as an option. There are times where that makes sense, but this isn't one of those cases where bigger is better. In a 5 8 inch bolt, I'm sorry, in a 5 8 inch bearing with a half inch bolt, you use a misalignment spacer and that's a stainless steel cylinder that fits on the shock and into that spherical bearing. Running a smaller bolt through the bearing allows it to twist quite a bit more. A 5 8 inch bolt might have a little bit of misalignment, a half inch bolt has quite a bit more. Um, they're offered an inch and a quarter widths for shock mounting tabs that are inch and a quarter wide or inch and a half. And you always go inch and a half when you can. That's the industry standard. I know that some air shocks come with spaces that are an inch and a quarter, but, and we can make them fit, but having them an inch and a half apart gives you a little bit more clearance so that the tabs aren't hitting the rod end as it articulates. When you're mounting your shock tabs, particularly on four link suspension systems, you always want to have your shock mounting bolts pointed front to rear. The reason for that is you're going to get more articulation, more angle change as the axle articulates. And particularly on those 14, 16 inch uh, travel suspension systems, that's a lot of angle change. So you want that angle change to be on the axis of that bolt and you want the misalignment spacers to eat up the caster change because that's already going to be limited by your drive shaft and the misalignment spacers um, will provide you more than your drive shaft does. So you're kind of safe that way. So always front to back. The next thing, uh, I'd say one of the most important things that we look at are the reservoirs. And so I've got another video dedicated just to these because it's a very common question that we get. A lot of people think that they're there just for cooling. So if they're building a rock crawler, they're not gonna need them. And while yes, they do a little bit of cooling, that's not really what they're there for. Inside of the reservoir is a piston, another uh, internal floating piston that separates the nitrogen pressure from the oil. And that ensures that the shock cylinder is 100% filled with oil. And as that piston moves, it's moving through only oil. And that's how you get that precise damping and tuning. 
Without a reservoir, the shock has to be filled with less oil, otherwise it'll hydrolock as that shaft goes inside, and then the nitrogen is mixed with the oil. That is like having air bubbles and your power steering system. You'll still be able to steer, it's just going to be mushy and squishy and not nearly as precise as it can be. So if you're going all of the way and spending the money and the effort to build a performance suspension system, you really need to have that reservoir to get that tuning and control out of the shock. So we always do a reservoir. This particular style is called a piggyback because it's kind of you know sitting as a piggyback on the shock. You gotta be careful with this setup while it looks very clean you have to make sure that the mounts offer the clearance that's needed. So if you put them on the vehicle and then you articulate the axle and notice that the tire digs into the, into the reservoir, the only thing you can really do is turn it around and that might get you into your roll cage or your engine or your headers. So you've gotta be very, very careful. Normally these work well in A-arm setups uh, or trailing arms where you know where they're going to be or the back of a, a, a truck with leaf springs. Normally what we would do is a remote reservoir. So the standard uh, cheaper remote reservoir option. This is one that I recommend the most because you get a lot of flexibility. You can kind of mount that reservoir wherever you want to. And in the standard setup, the bolt goes front to back, but the hose comes straight out. So that would mean that this reservoir goes straight into the tire or straight into the engine bay. In some cases that might be all right, but in nine out of 10 cases, whenever we're building them, we generally like to put a 90 degree fitting in there to either point it forward on the vehicle or backwards. So that's your standard fitting, that's your standard blue reservoir hose. They can be built to custom length, uh, although you don't want to go too far with it. Um, they did used to offer a stainless steel braided option that's no longer available. So they're either blue or they're going to be black. This is the 90 degree option. You'll realize that it's pretty close to the shock body. Uh, you can generally turn it about 90 degrees, so we usually build them at uh, 3 o'clock, 9 o'clock, forward and back. We can also build them up, but on a coilover, you got to be careful so you don't hit the hardware if you're pointing them down. They are standard hydraulic fittings, so if you go with a standard reservoir layout and then realize it doesn't work, you can always open the shock, add a standard hydraulic fitting. They're uh, generally just a half-inch NPT, depending on the size of the shock. Uh, any local hydraulic shop will have those. Very easy to add, but better to order at the time. If you're really not sure where you're going to be mounting the reservoir, you may want to look into a 90 degree swivel fitting. Uh, and also you'll notice this is a black hose. We do that a lot with custom colors like this shock. The swivel fitting is a, another hydraulic fitting. It does not easily swivel. You do have to loosen the nut a bit before you can rotate it, but then you can point that hose in any direction that you want to, tighten it back up and you're good. The only thing is it sticks out a little bit more, so you've got to be careful with a arms are tight applications, but this does give you a lot of adjustability. Um, another thing we can do with the reservoir is we can do a lower mounted reservoir. All bypass shocks are done this way. It gives you more of more control over the compression side since you're no longer compressing the nitrogen in that reservoir. So all bypass shocks come this way. We can do a remote reservoir on the bypass, or we can weld a lower reservoir onto a smoothie shock, which we normally do a lot of for Jeep speed or some desert racing classes to give you more of a controlled um, compression stroke. Uh, we'll get to some of the colors in the next bit here, but while we're on reservoirs, there are two common options that are available. One is the new finned reservoir and on 2.0, 2.5 shocks and most applications, I would consider this a cosmetic option. Yes, it does do a little bit of cooling, but like I just said, reservoirs really aren't there for cooling. However, on race series shocks where we're building trophy trucks, we put a much larger reservoir on the shocks. There's much more oil in it than the fins can do that. So on the smaller shocks, sort of a few exceptions, the finning, which looks really cool, uh, is mainly cosmetic. The last thing I'm gonna mention on reservoirs is a popular option that is the compression adjuster, and that's just this knob. And what that does is as the shock compresses, the piston goes into the cylinder and it moves the oil into the reservoir. So King puts another compression shim stack there. The oil comes in from the side of the reservoir. We can put a 90 degree fitting in there to make it straight again. Oil comes in from the side, and depending on how you turn this knob, if you turn it all the way to the firm setting, I think it's about 20 uh, clicks in there, 
when it's on the full firm setting, it's forcing the oil to go mostly through this secondary compression shim stack. So not only is it using the compression shims on the, uh, on the shock piston, it's also having to go through this secondary compression shim stack to firm things up. And of course we can choose and alter and adjust that compression shim stack just like we would on the piston. And then to soften things up, you loosen it and it causes the oil to bypass that compression shim stack so it softened things up. Generally it's not something that I recommend or talk people into. M most cases we can valve the shock right to begin with and so I always say if the shock's valved right to begin with the compression adjuster is only going to let you mess that up. Um, a lot of times people will buy them because they like the idea of playing with a knob or they like the idea of adjustability. They'll play with it for about a week or two, set it back in the middle and leave it there. Now, there are cases where a compression adjuster works very well, mainly lighter weight vehicles, UTVs, Jeeps, rock crawlers. You'll find a good range of, of compression valve tuning. You can soften it up uh, when you're just out playing and firm it up for if you're getting more aggressive and doing more rock bouncing side of things. Or if you've got a daily driver that's mainly your grocery getter during the week, but you go high speed desert racing on the weekend, this will let you firm that up and, and have that change. So there are cases where it does make sense. I've got a set on my Ford Super Duty and I get a, I w it's, it's a noticeable difference. I wouldn't say it's a big difference, um, but it's noticeable. Uh, I don't know if it's worth the money for them. Uh, I certainly would, wouldn't do it again on my truck. And then I've also found on some heavier vehicles uh, with A-arm suspensions, some people can notice a pretty decent difference, others uh, not so much. So the heavier the vehicle, the more work it has to do. I tend to find it ends up being more of a fine tuning setup. But again, we can generally get the shocks valve right to begin with, so you don't need this option, but it's one thing to consider. So that covers most of what we, oh, we've got the internal bypass. Uh, sorry, there's just so many options, it's hard to keep track of them. So the last functional option that we have uh, is the internal bypass. And what this does is this is just like an external bypass except for it's all done internally. Um, but it only breaks the shock into two zones instead of multiple zones. You have the, you've got one piston for the main part of the shock and then you've got a second piston for the top end of the shock. So for that reason these are generally valved as hydraulic bump stops. You've got your regular valving through most of it and then you've got your bottom out uh, valving near the end. When a customer orders this option, I normally uh, try and convince them to go with an external hydraulic bump stop first. It's about the same amount of money. Running an external hydraulic bump stop gives you more tuning, better adjustability. Um, uh, it, it makes the shock a lot simpler. It uh, keeps the heat external from it. So you get a lot more advantages running an external hydraulic bump stop. But if you don't have the space for it, or if you're racing in a class that doesn't allow two hydraulic shocks per corner, the internal bypass is a great option. Uh, so I think that covers all of the functional options that we look at, and now we'll go over some of the cosmetic options that you have available. For cosmetic options, I'm going to have to keep that definition a little bit loose, because a lot of them do have a function to them, but uh, I guess I would consider this more of a section on stuff that I don't generally recommend or mention to a customer unless they've specifically mentioned it, or they've got a unique application where it's necessary. Uh, for example, foam bump stops. I mentioned in the previous section how you should not be using your shock as a bump stop. There are cases like ultralight rock crawlers, UTVs, where they really don't weigh a lot and the half inch bolt and the shock brackets might be enough to handle that, especially if they don't bottom out all that often. So for cases like that, we can do a foam bump stop that's a lot more progressive than the hard rubber bump stop. Um, so again, not something that I really recommend. It is an available option on our website, but uh, I usually follow up with a phone call to make sure that it is realistically something that's gonna make sense. So that's one option. Another along those lines are spherical bearing grommets. Uh, these we do not list on our website as an option because they come automatically where necessary, and that is on bypass shocks and piggybacks. The grommets are not there to seal the bearings. Uh, in fact, they do the complete opposite. They tend to hold water and mud and debris in reducing the life of the bearing. They're used because in some applications, uh, A-arms in particular, as that upper control arm swings, you don't want the tubes or the reservoir to get in the way and get hit. So you have to position the body of the shock very specifically, and we use these grommets on either end within the brackets to hold it tight. It will not be included in the bottom rod end because that spins freely, and your lower rod end will pretty much hold that, your lower mounts will hold that rod end in place. So 
If you've got an application where you can fit a bypass or a piggyback and it moving around doesn't matter, I'd suggest removing the grommets. You'll get better life out of that bearing or just remove the one and that usually does a pretty good job holding it in place as well. Uh, and then continuing on that train of thought, shock boots. Shock boots are not something that we offer, sell, suggest. Shock boots do a really good job somehow, I have no idea, but on all the shocks I've ever owned, water and debris tends to get in and it stays there. And so you've got moisture and humidity and salt on the shock shaft and now you can't even see the shock shaft to inspect it. So shock boots are not something that we sell, not something that we offer. Um, in the maintenance section of this video, I'm gonna go over a better option than this, but uh, that's why shock boots are not listed as an option. Moving on to colors and finishes. The first thing that you need to know is the shock body is chromoly steel and the components, including the reservoir, are aluminum. So they require two different finishes. On the aluminum components, those are anodized and you've got a pretty decent range of colors there. Keep in mind that anodizing is is somewhat inconsistent. Uh, King does a great job with their anodizers maintaining their King Blue, but there are slight variations still. So when you're choosing a color, you can normally stick with a red or a green or a blue or maybe a light red or a dark red, but you can't be color matching um, with anodizing. So the most common color uh, we'll get is black, uh, and that can be gloss or matte. Then of course we'll do a lot of reds. You gotta be careful with going light on the red because then it'll turn into a pink. Uh, and the custom colors I've found do tend to fade a little bit faster. So watch leaving the vehicle in direct sunlight because uh, a, a nice red might turn into a pink pretty quickly. So you gotta be careful with that. Greens, uh, we do a lot of the lime green, this Kawasaki green, the monster green. Um, it's more of the brighter side of it, but then we can also do a dark green. So again, not a lot of shades, but we can do a lime green, we can do a dark green. Yellows and golds pretty much always turn out like this, any lighter than that, and it uh, stops looking like yellow any darker, and it starts to look more of a brown or, a, or an orange. So gold tends to look pretty good. We get your orange, uh, pretty much your pumpkin orange. Uh, not very common on King Shocks, but we can do that. We've got different shades of blue. You'll notice that it's a little bit, uh, a little bit different from the king blue, uh, but still pretty close. And then we've got your purples and another cool option. I don't do it as often. I do it a lot on ORIs. Uh, these are reservoirs for ORI struts, but it's the clear anodizing, and you get that nice aluminum color, uh, but it's still protected with that anodized coating. So uh, a lot of uh, anodized options there. For the cylinder. This is a powder coated cylinder and you got to be careful and I'm not sure if it shows up on video, but the cylinder I asked King to match their King Blue and it is not even close. This is a bright turquoise and that is what I'd consider King Blue. Uh, a little frustrating because their decal is a whole nother color blue, but uh, <laughs> that's besides the point. So I'm kind of glad that this didn't turn out the way that I had hoped. I knew it was going to be a tough thing and I kind of had my suspicions it would work out this way. It's with powder coating, we can do an exact color match. If you give us a code, uh, we can have King's powder coat King, King's powder coaters use that code, and it'll get you the color that you need. But you're still going to get that contrast. And when I called King to ask about it just for fun, they forced me to accept that these are the same color uh, despite not. So uh, we've learned to work with King on a lot of these things and we've seen a lot of mistakes. So we've learned from them. If you've got any questions, if you've got any ideas that you wanted to throw by me as to what you think would look good, I've got folders and folders and folders full of images of shocks that we've done that have worked out and a few that haven't. Luckily, a lot of this stuff can be changed or redone but it's better not to get to that point. We like to get them right off the first try. So I've found contrast works a lot better than trying to color match. So instead of having blue and blue, trying to have blue and black or black and red, uh, those contrasts really tend to look a lot sharper. Powder coating uh, is not just cosmetic. Uh, there are cases where we would do it to protect the cylinder. The cylinders are normally zinc plated, which holds up very well to corrosion. But if you're desert racing or uh, uh, desert racing, sand and stones can come in and chip away and, and hurt the cylinder. Powder coating can be a, a sacrificial coating that the paint will wear away before the cylinder gets to it. So we do a lot of that for the Middle East to help protect that shock further. Plus, I think it looks really sharp. 
for coilovers, uh, we, on this particular shock, we've got the green anodized components. This is the Kawasaki lime green and it looks pretty good. You'll notice it in contrast with the black cylinder, which is a black zinc. This is their old version of it. They now do a black Cerakote that I think looks a lot better. That green and the black really makes the green pop. And then of course you got the springs which stick out even better on that black cylinder. Uh, while we're on the springs, King does not offer custom powder coated springs. Uh, and that's for the main reason that you don't really know what springs you need until you get them. So part of our spring exchange program is we'll calculate the springs, we'll ship them out to you, you settle it, make sure that the vehicle is where you want it to be and the springs are right. If they're not, we'll swap you out, you just cover the shipping cost. And when you finally have the proper springs set up, bring them to your local powder coater. It'll be cheaper, faster, and you might get a better result doing them that way uh, than having us take care of it for you. So the springs will always be blue and you can either have them powder coated or spray painted, but keep in mind that springs tend to get chipped first on a coilover. And since they are just regular steel or spring steel, they will rust pretty quickly. So the springs will wear away before any of the fittings or uh, coatings in the shock do. So plan on having those recoded much more often if you're trying to maintain a good look. Uh, this shock has a billet aluminum slider, which is one that I don't think I've ever sold. It looks really cool, but uh, the normal slider, we can do black or blue, is just plastic material. There is a race slider that uh, is a little bit smoother, uh, lets the springs twist a little bit better. Um, we do that quite a bit for heavier spring rates as well. Uh, on the reservoirs, this one is, again, since they're aluminum, this one's anodized. So the reservoir can be made to color match the end caps, and I've seen those, uh, those look pretty good. This is a gloss black. Uh, again, very, very sharp. We can do a matte. And then normally when we do custom colors, we don't have King uh, install the decals. We'll normally have them include one of each or a set of each color separately so that not only can you choose which color you want, but depending on how the reservoir lines up, you can make sure the decals are installed in such a way uh, that they uh, stick straight out and, and show nicely. On this bypass shop, we've got a chrome coating. I mainly only do that for show rigs. It tends to look very, very sharp. I'm sure it's an absolute pain to maintain, but uh, chrome uh, is an available option on bypasses and smoothies. Powder coating and chrome plating is not available on coilovers because it gets into the threads and then you can't adjust them. So on the coilover, you really either have the regular zinc um, silver color or the black Cerakote now. On this bypass, we've also got a black anodized uh, piggyback reservoir coming in from the bottom. We've got purple components there. And the standard bypass tubes just have regular Allen wrench adjustments with nuts. I, I really like those. Those are, th th that's how they come standard. King has recently released the clicker adjusters, but you gotta be careful with those. They do allow for quick adjusting and they work very, very well. You just have to be careful about your neighbor's kids or your buddies coming up and messing up your settings when you're not looking. That's a very common thing. So if you do the clicker adjusters for fine tuning, make sure you take a Sharpie or a piece of tape to mark your positions. But the clicker adjusters are a nice touch. They can be added after the fact uh, or changed back to standard if you need to uh, very, very easily. Uh, and then this is the 2.0 foam bump stop, a little bit different design than the 2.5 um, that I mentioned previously. So the last thing I want to go over is the race series of shocks that King offers. And it's a little confusing because King goes between PR series, RS series, pre-runner series, race series. They've called them different things in the past. They used to be called PR for pre-runner. And then com people complained that they didn't want pre-runner shocks. They wanted race series shocks. When in fact, the PR series is a full race setup. All of the shocks that I've showed you here so far can run Ultra 4, they can run Score, Dakar, any racing. They are All King Shocks are rated for racing. The RS series, as I call it, as opposed to the PR series, does have some improvements. It's very rare for customers to need them outside of absolute racing, uh, but you know, for about 20 to 50% more in cost, you do get some improvements in addition to coatings uh, and seals that handle much larger temperatures. So this is your standard PR series shock shaft. Uh, we're going to go over both all of these in much more detail on crawlpedia.com, but you'll notice larger different design piston, uh, larger rod ends. I don't have the internal components on this, but a lot of the components are built a little bit beefier and heavier. The reservoir end caps thread into the reservoir as opposed to being held in by snap rings. Uh, you've got a protected Schrader valve. 
Uh, on the coilovers, they do have a very cool feature. They put this um, uh, slippery disc in the top coil nut so that the, as the spring compresses and twists, it's sliding. Uh, some shocks get some squeaking. Uh, some regular coilovers, PR series coilovers, get a little bit of squeaking. We'll go over how to fix that in the maintenance section after this. But uh, that's a cool little upgrade. And then larger reservoir hose, larger bypass tubes. This is a, a cloth braided reservoir uh, hose from a race series shock or an RS series shock. So that is another option. We, do, we don't really have those listed on our website. That's more of a special order. Uh, I get a lot of customers that order the race series and I immediately talk them back to the uh, PR series because a lot of times it's not worth spending that money. And even if you do spend that money, you might be getting features that you don't need and you've got a shock that's rated for much higher temperatures that's going to be leaking uh, when you're just running, running it normally. So you've got to be careful. Again, that same theory of spending more money doesn't always give you a better product. A lot of times saving money can get you a lot better performance. So hopefully I've covered most of the options. I'm sure there's some that I haven't. And if there's something that you haven't seen that you're looking for, definitely let me know if, you've, uh, if you're not sure what combination might work for you or colors that you, that you might like. Best thing to do is give me a call, shoot me an email, uh, I'm here to help. So that covers the possible options that you have. And now we're gonna go over what happens once you receive your shocks. So I'll let you know right now, the absolute worst part about ordering King Shocks is that miserable wait time between when you've ordered them and when you actually get them. When you order, I will always give you my honest estimate for how long I think the builds are gonna take. During the slow season, during the summer year, uh, months, probably looking at two to three weeks for a regular build, four to five weeks for something with custom options. Once you get to the busy season, the January, February, all the way through about May, you're taking about an extra week or two. I will base my estimate on previous orders that have shipped, the time of the year, your options, and I'll give you my absolute best guess. But keep in mind, these are handmade shocks. Things can happen. People go on vacation, bad weather, um, issues with suppliers. Problems can happen. Uh, we try to account for them, which is why we generally give you about a one week window uh, with the timeframes. But the best thing to do is just Forget that you've ordered them, as if that's even possible. Just sit back, wait. We will email you a tracking number as soon as we get it. But if you get antsy, if you just want to make sure that we haven't run off and disappeared, always feel free to send us an email. We get emails every single day, dozens of them actually, asking for status updates. And I have employees dedicated to following up with King and other suppliers to get those updates. Uh, we often laugh uh, here at the office because it's amazing how often the customer will call us saying that they're at that three week time frame, and then we look at the order and it's only been a week. So it always feels a lot longer than it is. And I'm personally no exception. Every order that I have with King for my personal builds always feels like it takes twice as long as it actually does. So don't feel bad about it. It just means that Christmas is around the corner and you're anxious for it, which is great. So uh, the time has come. You get a tracking number from us. A couple days later, you get a visit from FedEx or UPS. Keep in mind that we require signatures on all deliveries, so make sure that you have them delivered somewhere where you will be to sign for them, or a lot of customers choose to have them shipped to their office, so as long as we can verify a different shipping address, uh, that's fine. But uh, even if you're not gonna be there or if something unexpected happens, FedEx and UPS, they're not gonna leave the box on your doorstep. They'll likely hold it at the local sorting facility, and you can usually coordinate with them to have them do that. So normally not an issue, but they do require a signature. So the box shows up, you'll open up the box and inside the first thing that you're gonna notice is a lot of this gray expanding foam packaging material. So King does a great job packaging their shocks and the reason I'm mainly mentioning this is if you've ordered other parts, seal kits, shims, uh, other spacers, they'll generally wedge them in between different layers of this foam. So if you see the parts on the packaging slip, they're gonna be in here somewhere. You just have to tear apart the layers to find them. So make sure that you do that. Before you pull out the shocks, you're probably gonna notice a little plastic bag that has a white piece of paper on it. Uh, usually it'll say something like shocks are pressurized or are not pressurized. We'll get to that in a bit, but behind that you'll find a bunch of decals and that's pretty much it. These do not come with instructions. Uh, King assumes that because they're sen uh, selling a high-end racing part that the customers are gonna be racers and they know what they're doing. So don't expect to find instructions there with the exception of a lot of the OEM kits that do have installation instructions, but anything outside of that, uh, that's what we're here for. And that's the reason we spend so much time making these videos and writing the instructional articles on crawlpedia.com. 
So I'm not going to go into the setup. I'm not going to go into the install. We've already got a coilover setup video on crawlpedia.com. We've got a setup on bump stops. I'm going to be working on a bypass uh, video here shortly. So we'll get to all of that. Um, as you get in further into the box, you'll eventually find your shocks that you'll pull out and you'll start drooling all over them for a bit because they are, I can't get enough of them. I mean, I deal with them on a daily basis and they're just, just beautiful. So pull them out and make sure that they are what you ordered. Uh, it's rare, but it happens. Sometimes 90 degree fittings are forgotten or uh, sometimes King will ship out the wrong customer's order to the wrong person. Let us know immediately so that we can go ahead and get that fixed. We take priority on errors that are made so we can get them fixed as soon as possible. Um, so make sure that you check that you did get what you've received and the sooner you can let us know, the better. The next thing you'll want to look for is scratches and dents. King is very good. You've seen the packaging material. It's very rare for shocks to show up scratched or dented. But uh, if it happens, let us know. Uh, if you see any major scratches or major dents or leaking, uh, again, that's rare. King has all of their shocks pressure tested at about 700 PSI for uh, one or two days. So it's very rare to have a shock leaking um, unless it's been sitting for a very, very long time um, unpressurized. But Keep in mind that these are handmade. Some of the parts like the top caps require a lot of force to install them. So there might be some minor imperfections in there and that's just to be expected. If you're building a show vehicle and it is critical that it, every little piece uh, is, is perfect, let us know in advance. Um, there's not a lot we can do, but we can tell King to be extra careful with them, but expect to have minor, minor imperfections uh, in there. Uh, but overall, uh, they show up pretty good and any major dents and damage uh, we, we will get fixed and taken care of. The next thing you're going to notice is on each side of the rod ends or spherical bearings, you'll have misalignment spacers. I mentioned these a little bit before. Sometimes they're already installed. Sometimes they're zip tied. Um, if they're zip tied to them, cut them off. Double check the inside diameter. Even if they do come installed, double check the inside diameter. Every once in a while, the wrong spacers will get shipped because if one customer changes their mind along the build phase. Someone will take them off, throw them in the wrong bin. Another builder will take them, throw them in and not check them. So double check it. And a lot of the metric ones are very, very close to the inch sizes. If they're off in any way, let us know. We keep them in stock and we can trade you, trade you out very quickly. So those are your misalignment spacers and they simply fit in from each side. Sometimes they're a snug fit. Sometimes you got to tap on them a little bit, um, but they, they shouldn't require a lot of force. So those are your misalignment spacers. Uh, I mentioned the shocks being pressurized or not being pressurized. And that's probably the biggest thing that comes up with receiving a new set of shocks is checking whether they are or not pressurized and how to pressurize them if they're not. If the shocks ship compressed, basically fully collapsed like this, they are not pressurized. If they ship fully extended with the full shaft showing, they are pressurized. The normal pressure for a shock is 150 PSI, works well for most applications. If your application is different than that, we will have told you so before. It's also a very simple thing to change. So if the shocks are pressurized and you're doing some mock-up and testing, you can bleed the pressure. Uh, to keep our lawyers happy, I'll of course put on safety glasses and make sure to wear your mouth guard, hockey gear, everything else, um, just to be really safe. The reservoirs have a regular Schrader valve on the end. Loosen that up just like a bike tire. And then you can use a pen or anything to bleed the pressure. Be very, very careful. Don't point it at your face. If any of this seems above you, have a professional do it. But that's uh, just like bleeding a tire, bleed that out. You might get a mist of oil that comes out of it, but gobs of oil should not be coming out. There's an internal floating piston that separates the nitrogen from the oil. Once you've pressurized it, you'll have a much easier time extending or collapsing the shaft and you can do all of your mock-ups. If you move it too quickly or if you've got it fully extended and then you push it in, you could create a vacuum that'll push this end cap inside of the shock like that um, or inside of the reservoir like that. Uh, you're not hurting anything, just make sure that no debris gets in there. And this is also what happens if you run a shock with no pressure in it. Now, that's another very common question. You'll create a vacuum, it'll push the end caps in, and you'll start hearing this clicking noise. So be very, very careful about that. You gotta make sure that the shocks are pressurized before you run them. A another common issue, I guess not very common, but common among issues that do happen, is if the reservoir is 
bleeding or not holding pressure, it's generally not a leak. Remember, the shocks are pressure tested. So anytime I pressurize a, a reservoir, I use a bike, let's see if we can get this into the black area here. This is a bike uh, or a car tire valve core tool. That just goes in and you make sure that the valve core is seated tightly. That's, I'd say, 99% of the time an issue with a leaking um, shock. I'm not gonna go over the actual pressurizing phase of the shocks themselves. Uh, it's a little bit more involved than that. We wanna make sure that you do it right. So that's gonna be a second video uh, that I'll be doing here next. But you'll eventually pressurize the shocks to 150 PSI. I recommend sourcing and putting together a nitrogen fill kit. These are, we don't sell these, but the, this is the one that I use. I've got all of the parts for uh, this uh, in a list that I can send you. You can find them all on Amazon. You get the tank at your lo local welding supply shop. You got a regulator, hose, and then a simple tire chuck. That's all that it takes. Um, for most applications, it's 150 PSI, like I've said, that's just the number to stick with and never run the shocks unpressurized. So I know I'm repeating myself, but those are important things. And that's pretty much all there is to it. Of course, the next thing you're gonna do is put them on the vehicle and uh, see how they feel and see how they, they act. If the vehicle is performing the way that you want, but you want it, but it's doing one thing that it shouldn't or it's not doing something that you want it to, that's when you give me a call. If you've ordered the shocks through me, I will take as much time as it takes to follow up with you, go over all this information if we need to, to make sure that they are set up, installed, and operating properly. So that takes care of the over the basics of what you're going to need to do once you have the shocks. And in this very last section, we'll go over maintaining them, how to take care of the shocks and what to know about them once you have them. So now that you've got your King shocks installed, dialed in, tuned, and the vehicle's working perfectly, your mindset should shift towards, to, towards maintaining the shocks and keeping them working well. One question that we get quite often is, how long should I expect the King shocks to last before I, I touch them? And the answer is, they should last the life of the vehicle unless you do something to them to prevent that. And so what that means is, these shocks, they're designed for uh, absorbing tremendous abuse. They last the Baja 1000 within one use. So, if you're asking yourself, am I going to abuse the shocks to the same amount as the Baja 1000 would? The answer is typically no, and so you really don't have to worry about it too much. There comes a point after you get a lot of mileage on the shocks. Uh, this is some shock oil that came out of a friend's shock that was about 50,000 miles between, well, I actually never serviced it. So we opened it up and the shock oil is perfectly black. It's totally black, but the shocks worked perfectly well. There was no fading, no heat issues. It just worked really, really well. Now, I wouldn't recommend letting the shocks go to 50,000 miles, but um, the shocks still work. The most common reason for shocks going bad or causing problems or leaking is not so much wearing away of the shock as it is the shock shafts getting damaged. So you have high pressure seals on the shaft and the piston, the, the shaft is constantly moving up and down through those seals. Those are really high pressure hydraulic seal, uh, seals that will last a very, very long time. However, if you've got a set of shocks in the back of the vehicle and as you're driving the front tires are throwing stones backwards, those stones will eventually start chipping away at this hard chrome finish, creating a pit under which you're either gonna have some sharp edges or it's gonna start corroding and wearing away and rusting. Those sharp edges, as the shaft moves, will start tearing the seals. As the seals start to tear, oil might start dripping out of it, and eventually you might end up with a dry shock, and that starts scraping the inside of the cylinder. So you can see how that kind of builds up very quickly. So you want to constantly be checking the shock shafts. If it's a small dent, or you'd be surprised at how much abuse these can take, but if it's a, sm a small dent or a small chip, a lot of times you can take an emery stone, soften up the edges, and because of how tight these seals are, they can absorb and seal up a lot of imperfections. But protecting the shock shaft is the most important thing. As I said in the previous section, I do not suggest shock boots because those shock boots somehow manage to trap water and salt and debris inside of the shaft, and they prevent you from inspecting it. So rather than doing a shock boot, what I recommend is going to Home Depot or Lowe's, getting yourself some of this decking rubber and zip tie it to the shock body. So as the piston moves, it's being protected from the front. Any stones that are coming in are getting deflected away and the shaft is exposed from the back of the shock. So not only can you take a look at it and inspect it, you can also clean the shock. 
So this is a lot cheaper, easier, and much more effective way uh, to protect your shocks, and I, I highly recommend that. Again, just regular decking rubber. Uh, you can do other things as well, but that works really well zip-tied to the shock body. So that's the most common issue that we find. Uh, in harsh climates, uh, especially where they spray salt on the road or in humid climates, uh, the salt really starts to cause, is cause issues. A little bit on the shocks themselves, but normally it's the spherical bearings, the ones that are in the rod ends. Uh, and of course, this is a really bad example. But uh, th that bearing, if it gets damaged or worn out or you start to feel a little bit of play in it, those are relatively cheap and very easy to replace. We keep these in stock. They're also standard. Uh, we recommend uh, moving to a, an FK rod end with a Teflon liner. They work very, very well. They're relatively cheap and quick and you know, a quick replacement. So that's another common thing that tends to, uh, to wear away. As far as the shock uh, cylinder itself, these are heavy zinc uh, coated and all the components are aluminum, so the aluminum isn't going to wear away. But what you tend to find, more so on coilovers, is as components move and rub on the cylinder, they might wear away that zinc coating, and over a long period of time, it might get to the point where it starts to rust. Now, this cylinder is still in perfect shape, other than being broken off. It's still in great shape. This can get polished, cleaned up, uh, or if you want to go a step further, cleaned up and then re-zinc coated. It's really in perfect condition other than cosmetics or just run them like this. I've got a set I've had for probably over 10 years now that look worse than this but the shocks work perfectly because I don't really care how they look. But if you really want to protect it further, one thing that I would suggest, and it works on coilovers, bypasses, any style of shock, is put a coating on it. Uh, WD-40 works great, although it kind of wears away pretty quickly. Um, I've had customers recommend or have good luck with a product called Fluid Film. We've got Steel Shield. These are all products that you spray on to the shock and that keeps all of the salt and chemicals off of the shock body. And so when you pressure wash it next, it takes that coating off with all the dirt and grime and you've got a brand new looking shock cylinder behind that. Uh, things you also have to watch out for is battery acid or other really, really aggressive um, chemicals. I've seen a set of shocks where battery acid was dripping onto the reservoir and it started to eat away at it. So of course you've got to uh, stay away from the obvious stuff, but the hoses, uh, one thing that I run into on these is sometimes if your tire digs into them, they might wear them down with a steel cord. There's not really a problem with that other than the cosmetics. These are steel corded. These are very high pressure hydraulic hoses. So even if the tire wears through it, you, you know, take it as a sign to move it out of the way, but you don't necessarily have to replace the hose just because the steel cords are exposed. But hoses are relatively cheap and easy to replace, so that is an option. So we do see that. Um, the next thing on the list would be damage caused by improper installation. So one of the most common is overextending a shock. And while a shock can handle it you know, many, many times, after a while, it, as that shaft is coming out, and this is a bad example, but as that shaft is coming out, it might start to pull this lower seal cap out. So you never want to use the shocks all the way out to their full extension. So you should be running limiting straps. And we don't sell these anymore, uh, but uh, these are quad wrap limiting straps. You can get them at numerous other places. You bolt one end to the chassis of the vehicle, one end to the axle, and it catches the axle before the shock overextends. Now, one very, very, very important thing about limiting straps is they stretch. They stretch differently whether they're cold or hot or wet or dry or old or new. So this being a 42 inch strap will actually, under a slight extension, might extend out to 44 inches. Under a hard drop, when, you, when the vehicle catches air, might extend out to 46 inches. You have to account for that stretch to make sure that it stops the axle before the shock overextends. One trick you can do is twist up the strap to tighten it up or install clevises that are adjustable so you can kind of tighten them that way. But make sure that your limiting straps catch the axle under the hardest hit before the shock overextends. So these are very, very cheap insurance. You should of course be running bump stops, but that's not so much to protect the shock. I said that numerous times before, that's to prevent damage from your shock brackets from breaking off. That's also why I recommend a half inch bolt instead of a five eighths inch bolt, because 
That's kind of what happened in this situation. This is under a big mud truck, and a lot of stuff was wrong on this one. One, the coil springs were too light, so they were uh, preloaded too much, and the coil springs preloaded uh, were coil bound before the shaft travel ended, meaning that the springs fully collapsed, and then the shock was still trying to compress itself. So that's why it's critical to have proper spring rates, and um, we look at that very carefully during or orders. So as this truck landed, those coil springs bound up and all of the all of the energy went to this top cap which eventually caused it to rip off and this is the other part of that the top cap completely ripped off of the shock so after that happens things tend to kind of go catastrophic uh, this eventually ripped off the shock tabs they had to uh, plasma cut the bolt out of the bottom one and then since it got caught Elsewhere, it completely bent the shaft. It might have happened in any number of orders. Normally, the shaft bends, and then it causes a kink in the uh, cylinder, and it breaks off. But you can see things can go exponentially wrong really quick, and you get to this point, and it's unrepairable. Most stuff, broken rod ends, dented cylinders, worn-out cylinders, cut reservoir hoses, we can sell... Any individual part on the shock can be replaced. Uh, we do a lot of shock shafts. These are a very common part. Um, seal kits. We'll have a video coming up next that goes over how to do a full rebuild or reseal on a set of shocks. That's very, very common. Um, if a shock gets way too hot or hydrolocks, you could damage some of the shims. Uh, these are also used for retuning and valving them, so we've got a video on, on that coming up. And I mentioned springs kind of uh, going bad first, and this is out of that same setup where the spring actually broke, but the powder coating starts to wear away because that spring is constantly moving, and then it starts to rust up underneath it. The spring still works very well. Well, it did work very well, uh, and it just starts to look really bad, but these can go ahead and be re-powder coated as well. So the best thing to do is um, keep the shocks clean, uh, keep a good coat of some sort of uh, protectant on the shocks, um, and then watch the shafts to, to keep them from uh, damaging the seals. If you start to see little drips of oil coming in from the bottom of the shock, that's your signal to go ahead and do a rebuild on them. It's relatively cheap, very simple. We'll go over that uh, in the next video. But keep in mind, anything can be fixed. Anything that's damaged or needs to be changed can absolutely be fixed. So I think that brings us to the end of this now, I'm sure, very, very long video. Uh, I'll remind you again, check out the other videos on our YouTube channel. We're uh, adding more and more of them uh, as questions come up. Leave comments. I will try and get to them as much as I can and answer questions as much as I can. Take a look at crawlpedia.com. We've got a lot of stuff written there. Uh, take a look at the shock shootout on Crawlpedia, where we compare a lot of different brands of shocks. Finally, uh, visit filthymotorsports.com. We've got all of the shocks listed there. Uh, if you've got any questions on pricing, availability, options, uh, and remember, on all shock orders, I will follow up personally with a phone call. We'll repeat all of this hour and a half if I need to with you. I'll take the time that it takes. But hopefully this gives you 90% of what you need to know with King Shocks. Um, thank you again for watching, and make sure to subscribe to our channel. Thank you.